Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Welsh. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Iowa, and I'm director of the Papa John Biomedical Institute. I also chair the jury uh, for the uh, Trailblazer Prize for Clinician Scientists. And this is a prize that's uh, bestowed annually by the Foundation for the NIH. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Michael Wilson. He is the 2020 Trailblazer Prize recipient. He's at the University of California in San Francisco. Dr. Wilson, congratulations, and uh, thank you so much for being with us today. So the Trailblazer Prize honors the field of clinician scientists whose work translates research discoveries into transformative approaches to diagnosis and treatment of disease. I wonder if you could tell us what inspired you to start this work. Think, well, first, let me thank you and, and the committee and the foundation for this honor. It uh, was an incredible uh, surprise, and I, I'm really uh, fortunate to be recognized. So thank you. Um, so I think that the, the really the overarching motivating factor for me uh, has been uh, based on my clinical interests. Um, so I'm a neurologist uh, with a subspecialty focus in uh, inflammation of the central nervous system. So I see patients with uh, uh, conditions like meningitis and encephalitis, and uh, sometimes those conditions are caused by infections, um, and other times they're caused by autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. And um, uh, you know, as I uh, learned about these patients and saw them in my residency training, uh, it's they're they're fascinating uh, on multiple levels. They're challenging. These are diseases that are very challenging to treat. Um, but even before uh, you get to the topic of how you treat them, uh, they're incredibly hard to diagnose. So, um, in neurology training, uh, when we would have morning report or noon report and talk about the most challenging case on the service, um, typically it would be a patient with encephalitis. Um, oftentimes it could be a young person who'd been previously well and uh, they'd come in seizing um, and it wasn't clear why. And so, these patients are uh, discussed at length uh, in the hospital, um, and there are many possible causes of these conditions, and uh, the diagnostic tests that we have uh, are imperfect. And so about half the time when someone comes in with encephalitis, we never get an answer um, as to what, what made them sick in the first place. And that that's really impaired our ability to treat these folks um, effectively. It makes it difficult to give a prognosis to the family because we don't know, you know, some of these conditions are quite treatable and, and have a really good prognosis and others, other causes of encephalitis are uh, quite dire and have a very high mortality rate. So I think that that's been kind of the, the theme that's run through a lot of the work um, that we've done is to see if we can do better uh, upfront just to trying to, um, either make a specific diagnosis or at least um, give physicians a sense of what type of uh, encephalitis a patient has, whether it's infectious or autoimmune or, or other. Good. What's the uh, most challenging aspects of your job? So that, you know, on the clinical side, um, there's nothing more frustrating about um, being unable to tell, you know, a patient or their their family, you know, what's what's made their loved one so sick, um, and not being and feeling uh, stuck in terms of which way to turn and in terms of treatment, um, should you give more and different types of antibiotics, or should those be stopped and you should try to instead suppress the immune system because you think it's an autoimmune uh, condition, which, of course, if you've missed an infection, could make someone worse. Um, so. I I think that clinically is the most challenging piece. Um, you know, in, in the research setting, um, part of why we, we don't do such a great job of diagnosis in these patients is that uh, spinal fluid is a, um, we don't sample that very often in patients because it's an invasive procedure to obtain it. And um, 
uh, it's a dip, you know, there's a limited volume that we obtain and it's difficult to do lots of the traditional types of tests that we do to diagnose infectious and autoimmune diseases. So it's, it's a difficult fluid type to work with. Um, and so that's been a big focus of the work is to try to mine the spinal fluid for as much information as we can get. Yeah, very good. So the converse, what's the most rewarding aspect of your job? Um, I think, well, you know, the, the cases in which we've uh, made diagnoses and, and provided information to families and patients uh, have been incredibly rewarding. You know, some, sometimes uh, in particular when we can make a diagnosis, especially of an, of an infectious disease that's treatable, um, you know, we've seen really dramatic, uh, you know, great outcomes for patients um, when you can really confidently uh, go ahead and treat what you know is, is the problem. And so that's been uh, incredibly gratifying. Um, uh, and and even in the cases where where you diagnose uh, something that uh, like a viral infection that's not particularly treatable, um, you know families have still been very grateful just to have an answer. Um, you know sometimes these patients have been uh, suffering from an illness for multiple years, and uh, just to be able to end that diagnostic odyssey um, can can be uh, very satisfying both for the family, but also um, for the physicians just to be able to provide an answer. Yeah. Is there a specific example? Is there one specific patient that you uh, look back at and uh, uh, think was particularly rewarding? I do. Yeah. There's, I think the, the, first case that kind of was the proof of principle that, you know, this uh, new approach to diagnosis that um, we've been using called metagenomic next generation sequencing, which is a, an, an agnostic approach to um, diagnosing infections, um, you know, the kind of test case that this technology could really have an impact in a real time context was in a young boy, uh, he's 14, um, and he had an inherited immunodeficiency. Um, so he was particularly susceptible to infections. Um, and he'd had a, a meningitis and encephalitis that had been progressing over a number of months. Um, and despite really exhaustive uh, testing on the part of his physicians for a number of infections, everything was coming up empty. And so even in that context of someone who was prone to infection, the, the treating physicians were worried that maybe he had an unusual autoimmune condition, a non-infectious problem. Um, but sequencing revealed that he actually had a rare uh, bacterial infection, at least one that's rare in the United States, called neuroleptospirosis. And thankfully, in that case, um, this was a very treatable uh, condition. So he went from being critically ill in the ICU to uh, in a coma to waking up a few days later and then uh, returning home. And he's now in college and, and doing really well. So there's, I think on the infectious side, that's been one of the most exciting cases. Um, we've had a, um, additional cases where we found uh, rare fungal causes of meningitis. Um, and then on, on the flip side, found uh, novel autoimmune conditions, again, that um, have mimicked uh, infectious causes of encephalitis. Your really groundbreaking work has led to new insights into infectious diseases, inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases. And to do that, you've been using metagenomics. I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about that, uh, what it is, how it differs from traditional uh, means of uh, diagnosis that we've been using, and what are the, what are the uh, advantages and limitations of that? Sure. So the traditional approach to diagnosis that we, we all learn in medical school is to um, take a careful history from the patient, um, do a physical exam and send off some initial tests to come up with a relatively tailored differential diagnosis. So a list of possible infections that they might have. And, and we're careful about how we form that list, especially when we're going to be sending off tests on a 
precious sample type like spinal fluid um, because we know that every infection that we want to either rule in or rule out will require individual candidate-based tests uh, like a PCR, an antibody test, or an antigen test to either rule in that infection or rule it out. And that, that approach can be certainly successful, but again, we, we know that more than half the time it doesn't result in a diagnosis in, in patients with encephalitis. And so, you know, metagenomics is a very different uh, take on, on diagnosis. So in, instead of kind of coming up with a, a bunch of hypotheses and then testing them, uh, metagenomics is a process in which you, um, in an unbiased way, uh, sequence all the genetic material in, in a sample. And in, in our case, uh, we focus a lot on spinal fluid. Um, and then once you get all the genetic material uh, sequenced using um, random primers, so not you know primers specific for a herpes simplex virus or a West Nile virus, um, we then analyze those data to see what the sequences of the non-human uh, portion of the data set best match to. Um, and so in that way, we let the data really tell us um, what what is non-human in there, and then um, try to figure out what that has to do with the with the clinical case. And so, like the the patient that I uh, talked about earlier, the young boy, um, in his case, the the diagnosis was this spirochete infection, leptospirosis, um, and that's a very unusual. Uh, infection in the United States. Um, it's not an unusual infection in the developing world, and it's and it, it's found commonly in Puerto Rico, which it turned out he had visited about 10 months before um, we had heard about his case. And so um, it clinically made sense, um, but uh, it, and it's a known cause of, of meningitis. But it wasn't on the radar of the treating physicians because his relatively remote uh, travel history um, wasn't connected with um, kind of his acute uh, presentation in the hospital. So that was a great example of how um, an unbiased uh, approach to diagnosis could surprise you um, and uh, make a diagnosis that wasn't anticipated. Yeah, very good. So that's a nice example of how you're taking your research to the care of individual patients. I'd like you to. Uh, I'd like to know how do you think about this in terms of, of public health? How do you think about this in terms of how that might change our approach to diseases in general or to uh, pathogenesis of disease? So I I think this this type of approach we're seeing it play out right now um, on a. And on a larger global level. So um, certainly it's it's very useful for making diagnoses in individual patients, but um, from a public health standpoint, um, metagenomic sequencing is, is um, really playing a critical role right now, even in the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, not only um, does sequencing information uh, help you rule in or rule out an infection, um, but Oftentimes, you can recover um, significant parts or even entire uh, genomes of a virus, um, and that allows you to do um, many additional analyses, so particularly phylogenetics, so looking at the evolutionary uh, tree of a particular virus as it spreads around the world or, or within communities. And so um, there's a number of studies that are ongoing now with the coronavirus um, and with really high resolution detail of the sequences prevalent in an area. Um, this is allowing for kind of molecular based detective work to trace how the virus is, is spreading. Um, another, you know, role for uh, public health is, you know, another case um, that we worked on was in an Australian man who'd had a, a chronic encephalitis. We identified with sequencing a um, an orthobunia virus, so a mosquito-borne virus called Cache Valley virus. Um, this was a surprise because Cache Valley uh, is is in Utah, um, and uh, this virus was not known to uh, exist 
on the Australian continent. So there was a worry initially that the results had been spurious. Um, but it turned out that the, three years before, the patient had actually visited the U.S. Um, and gone camping and been exposed to mosquitoes. And so um, it was an example of what we think was an introduction of a of a geographically restricted virus to a new continent. Um, we have no uh, evidence that the, in this case, that the infection spread beyond this one patient, but it just highlights that, um, you know, again, an unbiased approach can, um, it can detect early spread of, of a pathogen from one uh, geographic area to another. That's exciting. So what are you most excited to tackle next, what does the uh, future hold for your research? So I, I think uh, there's there's um, for all the cases that we solve, um, there's still many more that we don't solve, and so I think there there's a, still a lot of uh, work to do. I think. Um, Two, two areas that I'm most excited about is, uh, one, um, like, as I said, with metagenomics, you sequence all the genetic material in a sample. And even in an infected patient, most of that genetic information you generate is human um, because it's a human uh, sample that you're working with. And so um, we've been uh, collecting uh, human gene expression data um, from the RNA sequencing that, we, that we've been doing for a number of years now. And we're starting to accumulate enough patients with particular types of diseases. So patients with that we ultimately find out how to have an autoimmune condition and other patients who have a viral infection and other patients with bacterial infections. And so I think there's an a good opportunity to um, identify host responses um, that are unique to particular categories of, of disease. And I think being able to, e even if a particular infection isn't identified with sequencing, being able to tell a physician that not only did we not find an infection here, but on top of that, the host response that we're seeing in the spinal fluid really looks a lot like what we see in, in patients uh, for whom uh, we've identified autoimmune conditions. I think that that'll really give physicians that much more confidence to go ahead and treat for a, a presumptive autoimmune condition or vice versa. If the, if the profile looks like a viral infection, um, that may steer them in another approach. So I think being able to better categorize disease is, is on the horizon. Um, and then also, um, We've done a lot of work now on um, antibody testing, kind of comprehensive testing for viral antibodies and for autoantibodies. And I think those um, technologies really um, hold a lot of promise as well. Yes, good future, I think, there. I, I wonder, the uh, FNIH Trailblazer Prize for Clinician Scientists is a, is a fantastic award. Tell, tell me about what this means to you. So I, I think, uh, you know, this is a very meaningful recognition of the work that, uh, you know, that I've done, but I've done, you know, in conjunction with a really phenomenal uh, group of uh, basic scientists and uh, uh, clinicians and clinician scientists at UCSF. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's a unique environment um, that we have such close coordination between uh, the lab work and the clinical space. And, um, you know, seeing that, seeing that recognized I, I means a lot. Um, and I think, you know, also, you know, these conditions, patients with meningitis and encephalitis, they're, um, it's, Cumulatively, um, it's it's not that uncommon of a condition, but many of these individual diagnoses are quite rare, um, and and I think uh, having this these types of diseases uh, recognized uh, more broadly, I think um, is is very exciting to see. Good. I wonder, you know, when when to make the discoveries that you made or or other comparable discoveries, there's so many obstacles and barriers and uh, things that pop up. Uh, I assume that was also the case for you. And I wonder, uh, how, how, how do you deal with that? Were there times when you didn't know where to begin? Were there times when you had to 
take a new approach? Absolutely. So, um, so neuroinfectious disease is not a, a well-worn path uh, within neurology. Um, so, you know, the kind of established uh, parts of neurology or stroke and epilepsy, neuromuscular, um, you know, areas like that. And so um, the world of neuroinfectious disease is relatively small um, and uh, doesn't have a traditional uh, training path. So I've been, uh, there have been definitely uh, points along the way where um, it wasn't clear kind of where to turn in terms of uh, um, where to do particular parts of my training or where to get funding. Um, and so uh, I think that's where, you know, being, you know, having these really compelling uh, patient stories to, to drive you forward in, in those uh, rough patches has been uh, really key. And, and of course, um, really critical to this have been, uh, you know, mentors along the way who um, have not only provided great scientific mentorship, but also uh, career mentorship, because again, it's, it's uh, um, a straightforward path, but, um, but uh, once, once, been able to get uh, enough momentum. It's really, it's really been a rewarding uh, field to work in. So you're winning an award for a clinician scientist. What does that mean? Tell, tell me what should the public know that means? So I, I think uh, a clinician scientist means to me someone who, um, you know, is, is out there seeing patients, whether it's in the hospital or the clinic, and um, they're driven by any number of, of unanswered questions that we have, whether it's how to diagnose them better, how to treat them better, how to characterize um, uh, their challenges better. And uh, they take that curiosity and that challenge and they take it back to the lab or they take it back to their uh, data sets and try to um, you know, make a dent in, in uh, that um, area of, of knowledge that we're lacking in. So, uh, Dr. Wilson, thank you so much, and congratulations again. It's been great to hear from you, and thank you for joining us today, and, and thank you uh, to the FNIH for this fantastic award. Thank you. So I also want to thank Dr. Welsh and the Selection Committee and the FNIH for this incredible honor. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to see uh, this work recognized and uh, want to really uh, also thank uh, the wonderful mentors I've had along the way, Drs. Uh, Joe DeRisi, Stephen Hauser, and Sam Pleasure, as well as, well as uh, close collaborators Charles Chu and, and Steve Miller. Thank you again for this recognition.